The owner called me up, whose family had owned that company for 50 years, and said, hey, I don't appreciate you telling my guys that you're buying my company. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, my guy saw your guy at the supply counter, and, and, and your guy said you were buying. I said, listen, that's my rallying cry. I tell these guys, we're going to take over the city. We're buying everybody, right? And it was nothing personal. He goes, oh, OK. He goes, well, I mean, are you interested? <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome back to Colorado. You're kind of wearing sweaters and coats there. It was 90 degrees yesterday. What are you guys doing? <laughs> it's 40 degrees today, 90 degrees yesterday, 50 degrees overnight we dropped. And you can't see here behind the, the crew. <laughs> We're all kind of nestled up in their caps and their gloves and their coats. But it's pretty cold out here. We have some heat. And uh, just welcome back to Colorado. It's good to see you guys. Good to see you. Good to be seen. Yeah, we we do we do have some heat. We do have a little bit of heat. You got some heat. Why don't you talk about the heat, G-Man? We got a, a nice Japanese selection uh, made by the Centauri Whiskey Group, uh, the Yamazaki. 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 Different from the Kamiki. If you Different than Kamiki. Uh, uh, Drew was mentioning the Whiskey of the Year. Whiskey of the Year? About probably what? six, eight years ago. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think, you know, widely considered probably a pretty... Pretty mellow version of uh, the whiskey compared to like the uh, the Kamaz Kam Kamazaki, Kamiki. Kamiki, Kamiki, Kamiki. Yeah, the Kamiki was charcoal. This is yeah. this is very smooth. It's good stuff. Very very easy. It's and, good stuff. Uh, well, cheers to you guys. Yeah, cheers. Good to see you both yeah. again. Here's, Glad you can make it out. Here's to Drew. Just flew in from Philly this morning, and boy, are his arms tired. Eighty degrees <laughs> in Philly. <laughs> it was so, ninety here yesterday. Yeah, Labor Day was beautiful here. This. 90, Ooh, cold snap came in, but um, so uh, oh, before we go any further, two things I want to talk about. Number one, uh, the special Macanudos. These are pretty special. Yeah, Maduro. Well. It's a Macanudo Maduro. Yeah. Well, and they came with this. You big, got this ring. They came with this big fancy ring. This thing is heavy. It, yeah, yeah. It makes it makes it really heavy. So it makes me think of a a nice Rolex. It's a twenty dollars cigar and an eighteen dollar ring. <laughs> Well, speaking of like a Rolex, I couldn't help but notice this thing on your wrist. Now, I've got mine, but I'm suffering from a little Rolex envy today. And normally we talk about the whiskey and the cigars, but why not talk about your watch and just comment on this beautiful masterpiece of a piece of jewelry and a, a beautiful timepiece? Uh, that's a reference piece, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a President's can, Day date. Can we see that? Can we? We got sure. a close up there somewhere, guys. Sure. President's I don't know day if you date. can see the the diamonds around it. The what do you call it? The bezel. The bezel. It's a bezel. Yeah. yeah. So this Rolex does not have the the diamond bezel, and I'm just saying Still it's still a beautiful to, reference piece. It's good to be the G man. So I just had to comment. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous timepiece. So speaking of which, non sequitur, let's talk about everybody's favorite topic. I've been seeing a lot on social media lately about guys growing their companies through various acquisitions and roll-ups and tuck-ins and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just thought it might be a fun way to kick off our discussion for those out there that are looking to grow their companies and expand their, their reach. So... Maybe just kind of explain the difference between the different types of acquisitions and just get the two cents from both you guys on various ways to do it. We can talk about pros and cons of each way, that type of thing. Gary? You want me to start off? G-Man? Yeah. Um, so I think there's probably two different kinds of acquisitions. Uh, one acquisition is just a straight up, you're going to buy uh, an operation and keep it satellite type op operation. You're going to be in a marketplace. You're going to want the trucks and you're going to want the brand and you're going to want, you know, the uh, the customer base and the asset. Um, so that to me is a standalone type acquisition. The second type acquisition is what we call tuck in. The tuck in, we're probably not interested in a lot of the physical assets, things like buildings, trucks, uh, inventory, not interested in that. We're lo really looking for customer base. It's all about monetizing the database. So the question is, you know, how much you pay? So um, a lot of acquisitions uh, have gone poorly for people, uh, probably more than, uh, than have gone well. 
And I always like to say that it, it's, it's not the strategy of acquisition that's good or bad, it's the price that you pay for that acquisition. In other words, if, if you overpay for an asset, uh, it's hard to recover. If you underpay for the asset, you tend to benefit. So I think our conversation should be a lot about, um, A, you're coming out of the busy season, coming into some places the shoulder season, some t- and some areas like the north, you're probably coming into uh, the beginning of your fall. Um, it's a great opportunity to, to look for people that you know, are, are tired, weary. Uh, maybe they didn't have a great season. Um, I, I don't want to promote being opportunistic relative to COVID, but certainly there are people that have struggled. Other, other people haven't done as well as some. Um, they, they might just be ready to get out. And so the strategy is about you know, getting you know, at least some sort of a marketing piece into the marketplace and saying that you know, as a company, you'd be interested in doing acquisitions. And there's there's a lot of ways to do the deal. And uh, I'll let maybe Drew jump in and talk about some of those types of ideas. But um, I, I like the tuck-in strategy uh, for most companies because there, it's less dollars, it's a little safer. Uh, the satellite type operation, you know, depending on who's running it and how it operates, it, it, can, it can bite you. And uh, so you need to be smart and careful about it. And uh, as always, we're happy as part of EGI to help people figure that out. So Drew, you wanna comment on? Some of that? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll jump in on the one piece there about, you know, how, how do you go about sourcing this, right? Uh, and, and I think, like you said, marketing is probably the best way to go about it. I mean, you can certainly talk to your suppliers and, and manufacturers, distributors and whatnot, and, and see who they know might be a little lax on their bills, might be struggling, may have talked about it. It's, it's interesting how many contractors will confide in their distributor contractors uh, or uh, um, manufacturers, excuse me. Uh, But I think what you can do there is you can then, you know, you can be overt about this, just going, going out there and saying, Hey, we're looking for people and and we want to buy some people. And you could put your own letter out there. I think more often than not, at least what I see is usually you find a broker to represent you. You get a letter, start, you know, you start hitting these contractors and have them kind of go through the broker, Uh, you know, just so, so that people are not turned off by saying they don't want to sell to a certain person before they even, you know, venture into the water at all. So at least get at least get the ball rolling through a, a discrete process with some discrete marketing handled by a broker who kind of you know does some does some initial uh, uh, surface due diligence and says whether or not you know the people who show any kind of interest are even worthy of consideration. Right. That's really an interesting point because when you talk about buying other companies in your market, sometimes there can be personal kind of conflicts and that uh, a particular owner may not want to sell to somebody else because of that personal issue, whatever that is. Whereas dealing with a broker, they don't know who is interested. They don't know who the other person is. Uh, I remember back in 2006, it's kind of a rallying cry for my crew. I would say, man, we're going to take over the world. We're going to take over the city, right? No one in particular, just we're going to take over. Well, our technicians and salespeople and installers are out there sell house at the, at, at the, at the supply houses saying, yeah, we're buying your company. We're buying your company, <laughs> you know? And I didn't say anyone in particular. So I get a call from uh, the second oldest company in, in, in the county, which was started back in the 40s. And the owner called me up, whose family had owned that company for 50 years and said, hey, I don't appreciate you telling my guys that you're buying my company. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, my guy saw your guy at the supply counter and, and, and your guy said you were buying. I said, listen, that's my rallying cry. I tell these guys, we're going to take over the city. We're buying everybody, right? And it was nothing personal. He goes, oh, okay. He goes, well, I mean, are you interested? <laughs> <laughs> and that led to me buying Wright Plumbing and Heating, which was okay. uh, just a great old brand in the city here yeah. and ended up buying the company, made some mistakes. And I would caution anybody to, to consult with an expert like one of you guys. And maybe I have some expertise too because of the mistakes that I made. And when you talk about the, the, the tuck in versus buying the assets, right? That was a huge mistake. We bought the assets. And here was one of the things I learned that even when you're doing an asset purchase and we're assuming liabilities and all those different things, there were uh, certain accounts payable that were not accurately reported, not through anything intentional, just bad accounting. And eventually had a lawsuit over the whole thing with the guy I bought the company from 
But here's one of the things that I, I'll never forget. I got a call about a month or so after we purchased the company from a supply house that was not even reflected on the accounts payable report. And it was $125,000 that the company owed this particular supplier. And they called me up and they said, hey, we understand you bought the company and you know, you owe us 125 grand. And I said, hey, that was not even on the, the pay. But when you're that close, it's hard to, diff- what you're responsible for, what you're not, if, if you're not so specific in the contracts and letting the suppliers know, like, here's what I'm responsible for, here's what I'm not. And because there was some ambiguity, I felt responsible. And I ended up paying that $125,000 off with a bunch of other stuff just because I just wasn't specific enough. I didn't clarify, I didn't contact the suppliers and say, hey, we are assuming this much, we're not assuming this. And just kind of left it vague. And that, and that, that ambiguity really did not work out well for us. So yeah. Lesson learned. So if you were going to ask that question today, um, I think Drew would agree with this. I would have told you to, to make it an asset purchase only. So you exclude the liabilities. It's the person who's selling the business responsibility. To I guess understand. a stock purchase is what I meant because we kind of assumed. Yeah, you everything. assumed the yeah. liabilities, yeah. and when you do that, you you are unfortunately responsible True. for for whatever is <laughs> out there. Uh, probably disingenuous that they didn't tell you that it was out there. I mean, a lot but of bad accounting. Asset what, purchase you know. would be the way to go, even from a satellite point of view. So, if I buy that company, I'm going to pay them, and they're responsible for paying off any of their creditors and suppliers. And, but they also get the receivables. And they and they get the receivables. Yeah. So well, that, the receivables that, uh, were massively overblown. <laughs> but in they that case, he's, if he's lying about both sides, he loses on both equations. We right? ended yeah. up settling uh, very favorably towards us because it was, and again, it wasn't intentional. It was just bad accounting. Yeah. Just bad record keeping. Yeah. Well, either way, that ends up in a conflict. And that's and that's a good point. It's probably one of the reasons why the company was ready for sale, right? Because when you have bad accounting, uh, I was actually reading an article on the plane today from our colleague, uh, you know, James Leichter, talking about you know financial instruments and how you have to have all of these things set up. And it was a you know it was a two page article with uh, at least twelve different things and um, and all tied back to of course having good software to handle this. But that's the problem is most contractors don't have good accounting principles on paper, let alone in a computer system. So just to kind of clarify that, maybe to, to kind of put the bow on it, you're going to buy a company, you want to buy their database, their phone numbers for X amount of dollars and X amount of future dollars, whatever, but that's it. That's a tuck-in. Yeah. That's a tuck-in. Yeah. I, I'm right not right against uh, straight-up asset purchases for you know, growth for satellite. You, you, it, it would be hard to argue that that isn't a good strategy. It comes down to what you're going to pay for it. Uh, you got a G wagon so, out back. <laughs> if I was going to pay you for that asset twenty thousand dollars, you would never sell it to me for that. But let's say you that could you have did, tires. I could trade it in and sell it and and be way ahead. So the the value of that asset is substantially higher than so twenty thousand dollars. So the question is, it's all about what you pay for it. Do, do you need the trucks? Do you need the sheet metal equipment? Well, that's do you need that stuff. That's the argument. So you're in Colorado Springs here. If you were going to be in Denver you probably wouldn't want to run your trucks from Colorado Springs to Denver. So the, the argument would be an asset in Denver might make sense. You might want the trucks. You might want that opportunity. Uh, so it depends. Uh, there's some pretty fine operators and consolidators uh, that have uh, been very successful at doing asset purchases. And they're growing. And uh, so it's a good strategy. But it's all about what you pay for it. It's, it, it. So my advice would be hire this guy right here and get him to help you value that acquisition so that you know you've got professional expertise that's not emotionally tied to it. Somebody that doesn't necessarily care if it's bought or not bought, their job is to protect you from you. Right. So the flip side of that, as you kind of mentioned, the consolidation, there seems to be a kind of a wave of that going on these days, isn't there? Yes, there is. What's, what, what's up with that? Is it, now I've, I've heard that the one thing that COVID did is it kind of enhanced the value of services companies because the, the people with the money looking to buy and invest are like, wait a second, these companies thrived through uh, a period of time in the economy where many industries were destroyed. Restaurants and entertainment and that type of thing just devastated. And yet residential services company, for the most part, did, did pretty well. So there is 
uh, a little bit of that going on. Would you agree with that? There's a lot of it going on. I, I, w I would say uh, in the 90s, we certainly, uh, Drew and I were both in the same organization at that time, uh, service experts. Uh, there was ARS, Blue Dot, um, Comfort Systems USA, um, probably missing a few. Group Mac. Group Mac. Um, so, you know, it, it took 20 years or so, uh, but the second wave is back. And hedge funds, private equity funds, uh, even independent private operators um, are definitely back. The multiples are are pretty good. Um, they're you know uh, four to six you know are the multiples for the small to medium sized companies, and upwards of twelve to fifteen multiples. That's crazy for companies that are producing uh, recurring EBITDA that you know is over a million and a half, two million dollar type EBITDA. So if you're a $50 million company with a 10% EBITDA, that's $5 million. Yeah. Those multiples are closer to 15. Mm -hmm. And we were only seeing, you know, say six back in the 1990s. And so the private equity funds and the hedge funds are, are seeing it. That's a good place to actually de to deploy that money. So it's, is, it's real. Is part of that increase in the multiples the reliability it's, of the industry? It is. I think it's not only reliability, but... It's also, if you look at the companies that are that scaled, their mid-management team and senior management team is, is in place and has proven that they can actually operate at a high level. Um, if, again, if you go back to the 90s, um, a company that was between five and 15 million was considered to be a, a, a big business in those days. And today, if you talk to the business brokers, they'll tell you that there's just a lot of companies that are in the 30 to $80 million range. That's the, that's the new sweet spot for right. the people that are spending the money. Now, if you're a business owner and you're listening to this podcast and you're saying, well, I'm not, you know, a $30 million company, um, it, it, you're still, you can still get a multiple of six, you know, if you're a seven or $8 million company. Um, so it's not, that's not inexpensive money. Uh, so if you're a business owner and you're thinking about transacting, it's all about um, the continuity of what you give to the person that's buying it, do they trust it, and the reliability of the businesses are there. So I, I know you've seen a bunch of this. You've got yeah. quite a few clients probably that are in that space, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a, like you said, I mean, back in the day, five to 15 was a big company, and that, now today that's a, you know, that's a smaller company. Um, but that, you know, that being said, you know, I, I think for our, our viewers, I, I think smaller companies, and, and, and I'll say less than five million, um, you know, and especially even those under two, I think they look at acquisitions and they say, oh, I'm not ready yet, right? I, I think, you know, that's a misnomer. I, I think if, if, you have, if, you're, if you're running your business well and you've got good systems and you've got good people and uh, you're profitable, you have good reviews, uh, you've got all the things in place, you know, necessary, you can go out and buy these little tuck-ins. I mean, back in the 90s, you know, like you said, with service experts, their whole thing was is to get these companies that were like one to five man, you know, or five people, you know, organizations. I would say probably up to 10 people now, maybe even 20 people now. And, you know, back then they were talking about, you know, just spending $20,000 to, you know, to get these companies and just tuck them in. It was an acquisition growth strategy back, you know, back in the day because what service experts wanted at the time was same store growth. They couldn't get it organically. And so what they talked about doing it was doing it through acquisitions with these little tuck-ins. And so, you, you know, today you're talking about, you know, a 20 million, I mean, a, a 20 uh, person company, you know, I mean, that's a decent, that's a decent sized company. You know, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're generating some revenue and that, there's an opportunity where I think like, you know, the right owner who's looking to get out, maybe because of, you know, they've been put through the ringer or whatever, the economy, COVID, their age, whatever. Um, yeah, they might be looking you know, to take a, a step back. In fact, we have a client in Virginia, big client in Virginia, but they bought um, they bought a company that was a decent size, and the owner's sixty. I think he just turned sixty, and he says he goes, I, I got like ten, maybe fifteen more years in me, and he goes, and I don't want any of the headache and heartache of employees or anything else. I just want to sell, and so we acquired the company, uh, complete asset purchase. We brought over like three people total, the owner, one of his salespeople, and I think one other key person. And um, you know, everything just kind of else, you know, tucked in. And it was a, I think it was about a $5 million piece of business. When, when people are either buying or selling, one of the terms, whoa, one of the terms that I hear often is the quality of the earnings. Is that, you kind of touched on that, is that 
the, the fact that those earnings have been going on for a long time, does that? Stability uh, of the earnings uh, mix. So residential change out, obviously you have a house. It's a, it's an, you know, it's a diversified asset. There's thousands of customers, thousands of individual houses. So there's service calls, plumbing calls. Uh, you can sell them water softeners, water filtration, plumbing, sewer drain, uh, obviously heating, air conditioning, accessories. So it's, it's repetitive, you can count on it. Um, you know, like commercial is a good business, commercial maintenance agreements, service agreements. So it's, it's about the stability of the mix. Where you're talking about new construction, you're talking about uh, commercial spec, or you talk about business that is here today, gone tomorrow, people will still pay for that, they'll monetize that, but that's a very independent buyer. Um, I have a, a client of mine uh, that's in the uh, Tampa Bay area. It's a $90 million company. Uh, but about 80 million of it is new construction, about 10 million is replacement. Um, the owners are just some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Uh, they want to sell, the family's done well. Um, by the way, the, the company produced $22 million of EBIT on 90 million in sales. So I want you to think about that for a second, mostly new construction, uh, plumbing, HVAC, electrical. Uh, so they're in all three trades. But uh, most of the buyers, the big private equity companies, don't really like that $80 million piece. Uh, it concerns them because it's, it's cyclical, it's new construction. You know, if something happens in the economy with a hiccup and it goes away, they don't want to pay a lot of money. So the way they're doing that deal is they're going to pay them a premium for the $10 million that's really st stable, and they're going to pay them much less of a multiple, a multiple of two on the new construction. So that you know, instead of a six on 20 million, you're getting, you know, a six on say 2 million and a two on the other 20. So it's not quite as lucrative, but it's to your point, if, if you're 60 and you want out, that's the motivating factor. It may not necessarily be the value of that, but yeah. what you're saying is stability and that's what they're All paying earnings for. are not created equally. All earnings saying. are definitely not so created So 50 equally. million from a new construction versus 50 million for residential replacement with 20,000 uh, service agreements, agreements yep. is a whole different valuation. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, because there's also the risk of, and that holds true with even some of the commercial business, if you had a contract you know, with a builder or a commercial contract where you, you tend to do a lot of work for you know, just a couple accounts, right? You, if you lost those accounts, would you basically lose like 70% of your business, right? right? And that becomes you know, part of the issue. So it's not just the economy, it's yeah. the relationship. Yeah, which yes. is why we preach commercial maintenance. Yes. And the idea of commercial replacement and service coming with commercial maintenance creates a more stable set of earnings versus maybe one really large commercial account yeah. or one large builder. And the interesting so thing about this $90 million company that he's talking about, I guarantee you where they're probably weak at is getting the people onto a maintenance agreement at the end of their first year. Right. right. So after the year, that the, the, the build a warranty is gone. Right. Yeah. Most of those guys, they're not service companies. They're new construction, you know, company. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're saying, if you're buying, it's a good time. If you're selling, it's a pretty good time. Yeah. And also I would hire a professional to help you on yeah. either side of that to make sure that you understand yeah. how to value your own asset or if you're buying somebody, how to make sure that you get a good price point for yourself. So, so I'll buy that G-Wagon from you right now for 20 grand. So. So, <laughs> so I would say if you're buying or selling and you need an expert, you should call me and I'll give them your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> one, Two and a half thing, experts. One last thing I want to throw in there is, well, because you talked about it twice. You, he mentioned it a little bit earlier about emotion and then he talked about getting uh, you know, someone to help you, right? Whether you're selling or buying. The, you know, the key to this is to realize that, yes, this may have been your life right? The, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, and missed emotion. family dinners, and maybe a divorce came through as a result of the, the business and all that, and a lot of headache and heartache and all that's going on there, right? But you have to realize at the time of sale, this is a transaction, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? It's a transaction for the buyer, and you need to look at it as a transaction. And, and when it's done, if you continue on with the company as like a salesperson or as a manager or something like that, you have to realize it's theirs, right? It's like, when, like Marcus Lemonis says on The Profit, when you take my check, I'm 100% in charge. Right. right. He or she who has the gold makes the rules. Yeah. That brings up an interesting topic we might want to talk about at some point, which is uh, family that's yes. a part of that. Mm. Uh, sons and daughters or yeah. relatives yes. um, that are in that. I think it's a good topic. And uh, so how do you deal with that 
and uh, and I think also just the succession planning and development of people might be something that we might want to chat about yeah. because a lot of that discussion that you're describing, if I have a son or a daughter that's in that company and I'm going to sell it, the question of what happens to them is very emotional for yes. the owner that's selling. And the person who's buying it may not be as interested in your family as you would be. <laughs> so <laughs> depends on the competency. Yes. So, um, Been there, done that. So guys, great discussion. Uh, like I said, just depending where you are, it's a great time to buy, a great time to sell. Uh, divorce yourself emotionally. It's not emotional for the person that's coming in to buy or to sell. It's a business and uh, pretty important stuff. So. Indeed. Great insight, guys, as always. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.